Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a great guest for you here today, Wayne Stinnett. And if you've been on K-Boards at all the last few years, you've probably seen some of his posts. He is a we're going to ask him all about his past, but he's been a U.S. Marine, a truck driver, a commercial fisherman, a dive master, and he's lived aboard a sailboat in the Florida Keys. He's been writing for a long time, but it was in 2013 when he published his first novel, Fallen Palm, and realized it was finally feasible to make a living as an author. He's about to publish his 14th novel in his Jesse McDermott Caribbean Adventure series, and he's also published a nonfiction book called Blue Collar to No Collar. We're going to ask him how he became so successful with his sea adventure novels, which are not sci-fi and fantasy, but I'm, I think you guys will enjoy listening to how he's kind of taken advantage of a, a niche that I believe when he got started was not super crowded. And um, Wayne is also associated with, or the president as, a NINC, which is Novelists, Inc. And uh, we've had guests on before that have mentioned that it's a really good conference to go to, so we're going to ask him a little bit about that. But uh, Wayne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's great being here again. Um, you've certainly done a lot of things in your life. What made you get serious about writing and start publishing a few years ago? Well, what you listed was really just a drop in the bucket. I've never been able to find my true calling in life until now. But uh, I've, I've always been a storyteller ever since I was a little kid. And uh, I was one of those nerds that walked around with a pen and paper or a notepad, you know, and taking down notes of everything that's going on around them, drawing pictures of trees and trying to figure out what they are. But uh, I started telling telling stories when I was a kid, and then uh, later uh, as a young teenager, I started dabbling in writing. And, and uh, then along came the 80s and responsibilities and parenthood and wife and all that. So I had put everything aside because back then you couldn't self-publish. And so then 20 years later, here we are. Awesome. Well, 30 yeah. years later. I guess. <laughs> hey, there's no math required on this show. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned in the intro, and I remember from K-Boards that you were kind of in the sea adventures category. And I think when you got started, there wasn't too much competition in there. Uh, what was it like for you? Uh, did you have success early on? I, I wouldn't say it was any kind of big explosive success or anything. I, just one book built on another, built on another, and uh, people seemed to like the stories and started building an audience, and uh, just one, it's just kind of a snowball effect, but the sea adventure genre, when, when I first found it, uh, I mean, it's always been there, but it was full of, uh, you know, Moby Dick and things like that, you know, the, your traditional seafaring novels and piratical stories and stuff, but I thought, well, my, my my books take place on an island and my main character gets around by boat. He doesn't, he, he owns a car, but it's mostly broke down. So uh, most of the time he's cruising around on a boat to, to get around. He lives on a boat. So it was just a natural fit, I thought. And at that time uh, I could, I could be number one in that, in that uh, little sub genre with, you know, a book that was number 2000 or 3000. Now you got to be in the top 100 to be in the top 20 of that subgenre. It's uh, it's really grown. That's the problem. Is uh, if you if you notice something's kind of open and can take advantage and get in there quickly, you have a shot. But it's inevitable that uh, everybody else finds it sooner or later. I don't. I don't think it's it's it hasn't hurt so far as sales. Um, my sales haven't diminished because of the influx of more people in the in the. Uh, genre it's it's just that everybody has everybody I mean it's it, the readers of this genre are just ravenous they, they want more and more and more and more and uh, we, we just can't keep up um, we should mention too that y even though you're doing uh, releasing your 14th novel you're not exactly publishing one a month so you're you have a pretty uh, you know, not so crazy that people can aspire to achieve it <laughs> kind of schedule. It looks like you do two or three novels a year. Is that right? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, this one will be the 14th in the Jesse McDermott series. And then uh, there's four others in the spinoff charity style series. And uh, yeah, I, 
I try to write a thousand words a day, uh, 1200, it'd be a good day. 1500 be great. And, but it, you got to have the discipline to do it every, not every day. I don't schedule every day. I, I don't schedule weekends for writing. Uh, obviously I don't schedule my anniversary or my wife's birthday for that. And Christmas, of course, that's out the window. So I just create a schedule for the whole year and block out all those days that I know I'm not going to write. I mean, you know, Christmas comes around on December 25th every year. So don't schedule that. Don't say you're going to write 5,000 words that week because you're not going to do it. Yeah, it's, and it's encouraging to be reminded that you can get, you actually have almost 20 novels, it sounds like, on 1,000 words a day or 1,200 words a day. And, and that's something that people can maybe do even if they're working full time. It averages out. Uh, I haven't checked it lately, but about a year ago I checked it. And my average word count per day for every day of a calendar year, going all the way back to the very, when I first started, was around 540 words a day. So it's, it doesn't really take a whole lot. And that's, that produces three novels a year. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and how long before you were thinking, well, maybe I could turn this into a, my full-time job now? It was pretty soon after the second book. Um, the first book didn't do much of anything. Fortunately, I didn't check sales because if I had, I probably wouldn't have written the second one. It only sold 23 copies in the first 10 weeks. And then the second book came out and both it and the first one sold a hundred more in the last two weeks of 2013. And it was, well, just, just two or three months after that, when I released the third book and the, I had suddenly I was making the same amount of money that I was making driving a truck. And so I figured, well, this could be a really good career change right here. Now, uh, it, it, you said you've been writing for a long time. Uh, does, so does that mean that you had a pile of novels uh, piled up when you decided to start self-publishing? Or when you made the decision to start self-publishing, did you do that with a specific novel in mind? No, I had uh, some short stories that I wrote back in the 80s and submitted to publishers and agents. And uh, most, of them, most of them ignored me. I, I think I got a couple, maybe a dozen uh, don't quit your day job emails or not emails at the time they came in real mail. But uh, I just kind of set everything aside. And that first novel was actually a compilation of two of two of the short stories. And I just kind of melded them together and then expanded on it and added a little bit more detail. And lo and behold, I had a, a full 75,000 word novel. And then uh, the second book, I had two more short stories that I had to draw on and uh, compiled that, did the same thing. And the third book I had to write all by myself. And that, that got a little scary. I didn't have any kind of, any outline or plot or anything, but I just knew the story I wanted to write. And it took uh, three and a half months to write it and another month to get it published. And by that time I was making more than I was making driving a truck and I set a date to quit my job. That's pretty good. Uh, and not, so now that you've been at it for a while and you've written, you know, you've written uh, uh, so many novels, looking back upon that early stuff, uh, not the ones that necessarily you turned into into uh, your first couple novels, but just the writing you'd done in the past that was, say, getting rejected by traditional publishers. Do you feel like maybe that you're like, yeah, that, that wasn't as good as I could have done? Or do you feel like your writing has uh, has been pretty solid from the beginning? No. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> I have I have no background, no formal education in creative writing. Um, all through junior high and high school, I failed English most of the time. Barely passed with a D. And the only class that I really enjoyed was one creative writing class with a, uh, a teacher who was named David Wharton Dyke. He was my 11th grade English teacher. And we all had to write a story. So I just I just made up a story real quick and submitted it. And he, when he handed them back, he graded them all and he'd given me an A and he, he wrote a comment under it. No, it was an A minus. He said, he said, underneath it, he said, it was great story. And I learned how to write. And I thought, well, okay, I'll just set that aside too. <laughs> 
your bio says that you're obviously you're we're working on your 14th novel in your series do you have a set number of books planned out for that series or are you just adding titles as you think of interesting plot lines i i get asked that a lot that's a good question uh, a lot of people tell me that they're going to sit down and they, they came up with a great idea for a new trilogy or a new series of five books or something and i always tell them why do you limit yourself to that if if the books are selling well and you get to the third one, why stop? Keep going. Um, you can use the same world over and over again, the same characters over and over again. Um, I, I grew up reading uh, John D. McDonald's Travis McGee series, uh, similar ac action type books to mine, uh, very similar actually. But uh, uh, John McDonald wrote 21 Travis McGee novels before he died in 1984, 1985 and probably had a manuscript half finished. But uh, I have no intention of ever ending the, the Jesse series until the same thing happens to me. Or Randy Wayne White's on his 24th or 25th Doc Ford novel, and he's still selling really well. I imagine that you're standalone pretty well. It seems like that's one of the troubles with longer series if you've if they have to read from the beginning, it can be a challenge to get new readers in. Uh, do, are, do, are yours all standalone so people can jump in anywhere? They can jump in pretty much anywhere in the series, but it definitely makes more sense if you read it in order because the, the world that my character lives in evolves. I mean, he starts out living on his boat and he owns an island, but there's nothing on the island but scrub, you know, scrub trees and uh, mangroves. And over the course of several books, he clears a place on the island and builds a house and eventually he builds a boat house and brings his boat up and keeps it there at his house so it, it the whole world evolves as you're going along but you can jump into every book has a beginning and a climax and an end and you can read them in any order but it just makes a little bit more sense to read them in published order I can see why these are popular if your hero gets to own his own island <laughs> that sounds like a fantasy for a lot of people well, all you have to do is take out the obstacle of money. Uh, my main character was an only child. His father was killed in Vietnam. Uh, both his father and him were Marines. And he went to work just a week after his father died. His mother committed suicide. So he went to live with his grandparents. His grandfather was also a Marine. So he's a third generation Marine. And just the, the, the development of that as it goes along. There's, there's just so much you can do with background information and everything to just keep adding to the story, just little side notes that add more and more depth to the character. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, you also have written a nonfiction book called Blue, Blue Collar to No Collar. Could you talk a little bit about what kind of advice folks will find in that and maybe what prompted you to write it? Um, Actually, uh, it was Chris Fox that told me I should write uh, a nonfiction. Chris, Chris is a great nonfiction writer. He's a great speaker. Uh, if you don't follow him on YouTube, you should. He's got a lot of really good information. But uh, I figured, okay, why not? I got a few weeks off. I don't have a book to start until next month. So I sat down and just, I wrote it kind of like I'm sitting at a bar and we're, me and you are drinking a beer. And I'm telling you a story about how I got to where I was and a few tips along the way to help you help you avoid some obstacles and things like that. But mostly it's a motivational book. Um, if you can dream it, you can achieve it, but you have to, you have to follow a set order. You have, a dream is, you know, a dream's a fantasy, but as soon as you write it down, it becomes a goal. And once you have a goal, all you have to do is develop a plan to achieve that goal. And so early on, I've got a background in, in uh, construction estimating. So I started making spreadsheets. Here's my plan. Here's my goal. Here's, and the goals have always changed. Every year, the, my goal is higher. And uh, so you just, you just keep working towards it. But you have to have the dream first. And the dream is to make a, a career as a writer or to earn side income as a writer or to live on a yacht as a writer and you're only limited by your uh, motivation and uh, your ability and in today's modern technology 
anybody can publish a book, but to publish a good one that's going to be successful and continue to be successful, you have to follow a certain a certain path. And it, it's the same path traditionally published authors have followed for untold centuries. Storytellers have been doing it for millennia. But just following that same path setting these smaller these bigger and bigger goals and plans on how to how to get to them and you can eventually achieve achieve whatever goal you want my goal was to my first goal was to uh, earn enough money from my books to buy some power tools so i could get off the road and build boats and uh, furniture and things like that woodworking well here i am seven years later and i still don't have any woodworking tools <laughs> Now, uh, this is something I think about a lot when it comes to, uh, to nonfiction writing. Uh, like in my case, for example, I started in, back in 2010 and a lot of the things that worked brilliantly to get my career started aren't really serious. They're not career starters for sure. They're not even as effective as they, as they were. How do you determine what advice might be helpful in general for authors versus what might have been specific to your experience? Uh a lot, a lot of, a lot of things work across whatever genre you're you're writing in. Um, marketing ideas are basic ideas. You have each person has to streamline their own marketing plan, their own uh, advertising plan to suit their own needs and their genre. What works for me might not work for you, and what works for you might not work for me. But there's a there's a a little bit of cross section there that works for everybody. And you just seek out what what's going to work and just stay at it. Always helps to unmute the microphone there. Okay, so as a nonfiction writer, do you have any advice on how to write a blurb which will help persuade readers that your book is a credible resource worth investing in? Oh, God. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I'm really terrible at blurb writing. Um, in fact, my most writers say that. It's, yeah, most writers say it's easier to write the book than that stupid. Oh, it book. is by far. Yeah, uh, th my first seven books, um, as soon as as soon as it was finished, and before going to beta readers or um, editing or anything, I sent it to a friend of mine who's a salesman, and we worked together in, in heating and air conditioning, and he sold it. He sold HVAC systems. He never installed them, never worked on them, didn't know anything about them, but he sold them. Before that, he sold fences. Before that, he sold pools. He's a salesman. So he knows all those little keywords that have to be in a, in a sales pitch. So I would give him the book. He'd read it. Basically, he'd just skim over it and pick out a few, a few things. And then he'd write the blurb for me, and I'd buy him a six-pack of beer. That's pretty expensive. I think Brian Cohen charges a couple hundred dollars for his blurbs. <laughs> We've had him on the show too. Um, so you mentioned in your email, I think that you're also writing another nonfiction book. What is that one going to be about? Uh, it's it's a book that I'm going to write in the future, probably towards the end of this year or early next year, and it will be uh, no collar to white collar. Uh, I've achieved the ability to go from a blue collar job to where I could just take my shirt off and go out on the boat, and now I'm moving into uh, a territory that. It's kind of scary. Um, I'm going to start publishing other authors. Uh, Twenty in 2019, at some point in 2019, I'll be taking on other authors and publishing them. Not quite the same as the big houses do. Uh, the terms will be a whole lot different. Uh, the author's going to make a lot more money because I don't need to make a whole lot of money. But uh, it'll be called uh, No Collar to White Collar, and it'll be the change from living the lifestyle of a successful writer to living the lifestyle of a business owner. It's interesting. A, a lot of authors, I think, just have no interest in that. They just want to make a living and do the introvert thing and, and be so delighted to you know, not have to deal with other people. But we've definitely seen a lot of folks that once they do get some success, they, they want to start collaborating or uh, starting a publishing company or doing anthologies is something I'm thinking about doing. Um, what... What is making you want to, because you're making a lot more work for yourself. <laughs> I'm guessing it will be. What's making you uh, want to pursue that? Uh, I'm hoping to make less work for myself. Um, 
the whole idea of Down Island Press is going to be that they publish my books along with other authors, and then I'll be able to just do the writing. Uh, I'll teach people how to do the, the marketing and the publishing part of it. And I've got a nice office here. It's a thousand square feet. I'm only occupying four, uh, let's see, 14 by 14. That's what, 280 square feet, something like that, 300 square feet. But the front part of my office is uh, big enough for, it, it could, well, before I moved in, it had five cubicles. And uh, I want to put people in those, in those chairs who know a little bit about the publishing business. Um, they don't have to be working from here, from this office. They could re work remotely and do the job just as well. But I'll have a number of editors, a number of formatters, a number of uh, graphic artists and design cover designers. And I have to do that to be able to have multiple projects going at one time. So the, the idea is for me to work less as a publisher and more as a writer. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to make my life a little bit easier. All right. I'm going to look forward to the update and see if uh, that actually happens that way. I think maybe because I'm an introvert, it sounds like just having to manage other people would take something like that to a whole more stressful and uh, harder level for me than just doing everything myself. But I uh, recognize that we're not all built the same way. Well, I've got a background in, in business management. Uh, I ran several companies companies, construction companies over the years, and ran my own business as a truck driver for 13 years. And so working with other people, it's not a problem. Uh, working with employees, I don't have any problem hiring, locating the right people, uh, interviewing, all that. And it's all second nature from, from past experiences. So the idea is to, you know, have somebody else do the things that I currently do Right now, I come in at four or five o'clock in the morning. I've got my writing done before the sun comes up. And then the rest of the day, from eight o'clock in the morning till four or five at night, I'm working on the publishing side of it. I don't want to do that job anymore. I want to create a business that will do that for me. And part of that will be publishing my books and others. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing how it comes out for you. And um, I guess we should ask you about the marketing stuff since, uh, as we mentioned, you're doing, you know, two, three books a year and you've managed to keep them selling. <laughs> you know, you have a good sales ranking on your books and they've got tons of reviews on Amazon. And that's no easy thing to do, especially as you're going into 2019 here. Could you talk a little bit about like maybe how it was marketing and selling in the beginning and then what's changed and how you're keeping them going uh, month in and month out. In, in the beginning, I owe a whole lot to BookBub. I mean, if, if, if you're a follower of Keyboards, and I know you are, I, I was getting a BookBub uh, featured pro promo just about every month in 2014. Uh, I think I got nine in 2014, seven in 2015, and then it, this past year, only one. And uh, it's getting a lot harder to get that coveted book club slot but uh, that really got me got a lot of uh, readers to read my books and got some fans and uh, it, I think today things things have changed a lot um, I know it, I've noticed that before you know two or three years ago when I'd release a new book my my core readers would, you know, they'd shoot it up the charts and it'd be in the top 500. And that, that would attract other readers. And they would say, oh, well, this is book number eight. Let's go find book number one. And book number one would go way up in rank. Book number two would follow behind it. And for a month after a new release, all my backlist would just have a surge. And today, it's almost like I'm writing for my existing readers. Uh, a new release today has very little effect on the first book. I dropped the price of the first book to 99 cents even. And when I have a release, I get an uptick in sales of maybe, you know, maybe a hundred percent uptake, but nothing like it used to be. So it's, it's a whole lot more writing to the, to the individual readers, the ones that are already your fans. Once you get well into a series like this, uh, have you tried, I assume you're trying different things, uh, maybe the Facebook advertising, Amazon advertising. Uh, what kinds of things have you tried over the years? 
Um, Amazon, of course. Uh, I haven't done, I've never done a Facebook ad or a book by bed. Uh, I'm just intimidated by creating ad copy. Ah, it scares me. But uh, right now I'm doing a lot of advertising on radio and in magazines. Uh, my, my target audience, obviously, are seafaring people, uh, cruisers and sailors. So my, you'll start seeing my ads in uh, different sailing magazines. Uh, one of my radio ads runs, two radio ads run every hour on pirate radio, and that broadcasts to 80-something uh, FM stations around the Caribbean and streaming online. Uh, they've got a really, really large number of listeners. And that's, that's, that's really been carrying me more than AMS lately. AMS ads really lost their punch in the last, in the last year. Yeah, that's interesting. I think you might be the first person we've heard from who, like that's the radio and, and magazine are two very, I want to say traditional ways to, to traditional publishing style ways to advertise a book. And it's not usually the sort of thing that you hear an indie doing. Like how affordable is that compared to the other uh, advertising types? Well, because of today's technology, it's actually very affordable, even TV advertising. Um, with today's technology, everything goes through the internet. So you have, you know, XYZ Cable Company, they have 250,000 cable subscribers in the Metro Miami area. And some of those people are gonna be my target audience, some aren't. But the people in uh, Kansas City, they're not my target audience. They're, you know, there's no boats out there, there's just cornfields. So you can actually drop an ad into uh, a TV slot and it goes through the, through the cable company, it goes, you target the zip code and your ad only plays for that one zip code that you want to target. And it's only about 25, 25 or $30 for a television ad doing that. Wow. That's uh... I mean, just that's the sort of thing, like this is not intelligent marketer, Joe, this is just regular person, Joe. That's the kind of thing I would throw some money at just to say that I'd done it once. Yeah. Got, you got your book on TV. That's exactly. You just put it on the, on the DVR and just save it. Uh, but I, I'm, also, I'm also a part owner of Pirate Radio, so that helps a little bit. That helps. So I, I, get a, I get a nice discount. And uh, one of the other owners is a, a trop rock musician, and uh, he's recorded a song about my books, and that gets a lot of air times, too. Nice. All, all those little things. It's not just one thing anymore that, that works. Uh, today, when I get a book bub, my last one was December 24th, um, you barely notice the spike from a book bub once you get to a certain level. It, book bub doesn't compete with my new releases. My new releases outsell book, book bub. I earn more on a new release, uh, at, least, at least double what I earn on a book bub day. But uh, just diff all these different things working together no one thing covers everything. There's no, you know, one size fits all. You have to do a whole lot of little things. And the primary thing is to get your name out there. Yeah, it's very repetitive to hear the same radio ad twice an hour, 24 hours a day. If you listen to pirate radio, you're going to hear my ad. <laughs> and you're going to know, you're going to recognize the name Wayne Stennett. And maybe you're looking for a book one day and that name's going to pop into your head. So you mentioned that your first book in the Caribbean Adventure Series is priced low at 99 cents. Has it always been priced that low? No, uh, I actually wrote it to be a perma-free. Uh, that was the common wisdom of the time in 2014. And when I, after I finished it, I liked it so much, I said, no, there's no way I'm going to give this away. So I priced it at two ninety nine, and it sold like crazy. Uh, it already had for three three books in the series, and this was a prequel to the first three. So the first three were doing well, and here comes this prequel, and everybody bought the prequel because it's a you know it's a new book. All my all my readers bought it. That gave it instant visibility. Uh, a lot of my non readers who'd never heard of me before, and there are millions and millions and millions of those. They see it and say, oh, well, maybe this will be a good book. And they jumped right on it. And, but it, the, it, it just evolved really, really slowly. But to do it all over again, I would, I would suggest doing 
doing them in order and maybe having two or even three books already written, ready to go, and then publish them on a regular basis, uh, three or four weeks apart while you're writing the fourth book. <laughs> this is what Don McKenna did. This is what I advised her to do. And she is huge now in, in sea adventures. Uh, you, you mentioned that you had, if you experimented with permafree, I mean, is that something you plan on doing again in the future or you just, you tried it, didn't care for it and moving on now? No, I never even tried it. I, I wrote it to be a permafree and ended up pricing it at two ninety nine, and it stayed at two ninety nine until just last year. And it's the first time I lowered the price on it. I like the idea of the, the radio advertising. That's pretty cool. I, I think it would work especially well in your case since you're doing things that are local to a specific place. I do feel like it might be more of a challenge for like Star Wars kind of in a far galaxy far, far away, which a, a lot of our listeners are listening to, to find your correct demographic on a, you know, small cable television channel. But are, are you aware of anybody else that's uh, maybe in other genres and trying that kind of thing out? Um, no, not that I know of. I, I haven't talked to anybody that's doing it, and uh, mine are the only ones that I'm hearing. But uh, it, it is it is a very very small niche market. Um, I've got an FM transmitter right here in my office. It's sitting right behind me. It's a box about the size of a cell phone, and that is a modern day FM radio radio station. It broadcasts on low power, uh, ten watt, and it covers about, you know, three miles in any direction, but I'm right on the ICW. So every boat going by is going to be able to pick up my radio station. Uh, sounds really fun. Do you have any su suggestions for people who, uh, what, I think one of the challenges of TV and radio is that you wouldn't really know, you can't measure clicks or anything like that. Have you, is there any way like you've used certain links or anything to try to measure how many sales you're getting from doing that? You can't really measure clicks. No, not, not on it. Definitely not on FM. You can't even predict how many, how many listeners are listening, but on the streaming side, I know exactly how many people are listening to the streaming uh, broadcast on pirate radio. I know exactly, you know, if, if, uh, if I have a contest and I, I tell my readers on Facebook or something, Go to Pirate Radio, listen for my song, Rusty Anchor Bar and Grill, and the first person to respond and tell me exactly what, exactly what time it played wins a Kindle. And instantly, the numbers, numbers of listeners go from 7,000 or 7,500 way up to 10 or 12,000. So it, I, can, I can definitely justify it that way because I know that they're listening. And we do, we do live broadcasts sometimes from uh, – well, next in two weeks, we'll be down in Miami at the boat show and we'll be doing a live broadcast and interview there. Um, and whenever those happen, again, the, the numbers, the numbers go way, way up. So it definitely works. You just have no way of, you know, pinpointing exactly what's working and how. Oh, that's great that you found that, that really, and it works for your niche and your location where your books are set. Um, I am curious I noticed you're all in with Amazon and, and do Kindle Unlimited and such. Do you get any pushback from people who maybe hear the ads and they're a Barnes and Noble person? So they're, you know, they're kind of looking for your books elsewhere. Not so far. Um, my ads, well, the ad that's currently running now for the, for the book that's on pre-order states, you know, it's you know, it, the, my, my narrator does all my ads and he says that uh, it's now available on Amazon. So there's no mistake in where you can get it from. If you're Barnes and Noble, well, you're going to have to wait and order it from, you know, some other way. <laughs> but I don't plan to stay KU forever. I, I do plan to go wide probably this year also when, as soon as I get the publishing business set up. And uh, it's going to be a hit. I mean, I, I get 50% of my income comes from KU. But I think that what I lose on KU, I'll almost gain it all back by KU readers buying the books instead of borrowing them. And what I don't gain back, I should gain back on Barnes and Noble and Kobo and all the others. I was going to ask you, because I was wondering if you've been in Kindle Unlimited for the, from the beginning and if it concerned you at all, kind of relying fully on Amazon, it sounds like you might be <laughs> looking to branch out just so maybe you're not so reliant on them. 
No, not, not, not for that reason. I, I have been in KU from the very start. Um, the first book I published was in KU. I've never taken a book out of KU. Uh, the only reason I, I plan to is, is to increase readership. Um, Amazon has, you know, there, you, can, you can gain more readers on Amazon, no problem. But to gain more outside of Amazon, that's, that's when you start becoming um, a John Grisham or James Patterson. And both of, both of those guys write great books. Uh, unfortunately, they're traditionally published, so they don't, they don't make very much money. <laughs> um, do you think that you'll go completely wide with all of your books, or are you going to maybe stagger things and experiment a little bit before fully leaving Amazon? No, everything, uh, when, I, when I pull the plug, it's going to be all at once. Uh, I'll, take, I'll start with book one, pull it out. If book two is eligible to be pulled out, I'll pull, I'll, I'll just do, but I want to do them in order and it may take, you know, it may take six or eight months, but I want to do them in order, release book one wide and then a week or two later, release book two wide and then a week or two later. But, you know, because of the terms of service, I may have to wait, you know, 90 days on one of them, but uh, at least every 90 days, I'm going to, I'm going to go wide with one book. It's interesting because like as a result of all these books being put into Amazon exclusively, when you eventually go wide, you're, you're going to have like a 14 book rapid release. Like we talk about how effective rapid release could be. You're basically giving yourself a second uh, launch that will follow the ideal uh, marketing trajectory. So hopefully it works out well for you because it seems like it might. I could very realistically just uncheck all 18 boxes yeah, and just, just wait until all of them are completely out. And then, boom, one, one a week and have it all done within a very short time. Yep. That, that would be a pretty cool idea, too. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, you said that a lot of your income comes from page reads. About half of your income comes from page reads. But uh, do you get any other value out of being uh, in Kindle Select, like the price promotion stuff? Uh, or is it just mostly uh, for the increased visibility in the page reads? It was, when I first started in KU, it was for the marketing. Um, to be able to reduce your, reduce your price to 99 cents for a short, short amount of time and still get the 70%. And you can couple that with a book bub or another big advertiser. Um, it doubles, it doubles your money for that, you know, for that short term. And the, the visibility you get from a big, uh, a big promotion, it far outweighs any price reduction. But, uh, I've never done a book bub on any book after book six and they're all in KU and I've never done a Kindle countdown deal or a free, free term on any of seven through now 13 and uh, the last two charity books. So I've really only concentrated on seven books out of the 18. All right. So you've said that you've been with KU since it started. In this day and age, do you, would you recommend to new authors that they should put all their eggs in Amazon's basket or should they try releasing wide? Yeah, definitely. The, the, marketing, the marketing tools that Amazon provides, and it's, I don't see it as putting all your eggs in one basket. That's, that's kind of a doomsday prophecy. Uh, what if Amazon collapses? Okay, well, what if Amazon collapses? It's what if... What if Barnes and Noble collapses? That's a more likely scenario. So it's not really so far as putting all your eggs in one basket. It's what's going to be a good marketing decision. And with the ability to do the countdown deals in the free days, early on, that's really paramount to getting your, getting your book out there, getting it in the hands of readers, and getting them to be able to pronounce your name. Yeah, I've definitely noticed in my experiments with, uh, I have most of my stuff wide and I've taken to launching new series and new books into Amazon for that it visibility advantage over the last couple of years. And I, I've definitely seen that uh, I get a much better sales ranking, more borrows and sales from books, even when I'm not doing anything. But as soon as I uncheck them and move them to the other places, all other things being equal, like it yeah. suddenly drops from 4,000 in the store to like 30,000 in the store. It's like, gee whiz. <laughs> Is this an advantage? I think so. <laughs> it, it, it's definitely an advantage. Uh, it keeps the visibility up. Um, if you write long epic novels, uh, 150,000, 200,000 words, 
you earn just as much on KU as you do on for a, a two ninety nine or three ninety nine sale. Yeah, we had uh, Miranda Hanfleur on uh, last year who does Epic Fantasy, and I think her books are like seven eight hundred pages. And I don't remember what she was earning exactly, but it was more for a borrow than a sale. So I was like, well, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, she could price probably around five ninety nine and make an equal amount on on a sale as as a full read. Definitely. And, um, you know, who knows if that will continue on in the future, but for as long as it's like that for right now, I, I say, if you're interested, take advantage of it if you can. Um, well, it's, you it's a constantly evolving thing. We, before that, we had KOLL. And after KOLL, we had KU1 and then KU2. And there's going to be something to replace that one day. And uh, I, what it is, I don't know. Uh, I'll, when it comes along, I'll take a look at it. If it seems to be a viable marketing choice, and, and that's what I'll go with. But for right now, I'm still in KU and have no intention of leaving KU before the end of the year, probably. Right. There's, there's nothing wrong with, even though you want to build a brand and a large audience over time, with taking advantage of the little tactics that may work really well this year. And uh, that's why we love to have all the different guests on and find out what things people are doing that happen to be helping them with finding extra success right now. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you'd seen somebody in your genre do the rapid release and have a lot of success. Um, it sounds like with the radio and the other things you have going on that you're not super reliant on just like how well a launch does. But have you had any trouble with like the 90 day cliffs or the 30 day cliffs or things you hear people talking about where books will take a nosedive if you're not really proactive with uh, keeping no, them going? The, the launch is extremely critical now. Like I said before, I'm writing to my own audience now. Uh, a new release doesn't bring in new readers to the first to my backlist like it used to. So the launch is super critical. In fact, the launch has to produce enough money to get me over the next three, three or four months to the next book. And so I have to set a good half of that month aside just to get through these, the lean months. Uh, these last two months have been really dismal. Well, I call it dismal. A lot of people would call it really super, but I haven't earned enough money to pay my taxes this month. So fortunately I had a really good launch four months ago and that money's still sitting in the bank. Yeah, that's uh, like, so you talk about, you know, your, your, uh, your launches are important. Um, do you do anything like specifically to, to uh, what is your marketing strategy around a, a launch? Is, is your marketing con constant or do you do more marketing immediately before a launch? Um, no, I, the, the AMS ads are pretty constant. They run constantly. My radio ads run constantly. The magazine ads are constant. Uh, when a new book comes along, uh, I have a, my, my newsletter subscribers, they number close to 6,000 now, and these are all organic. And with a new launch, um, my books usually wind up in the top 100s, sometimes around number 50. And that's just, just an organic launch with no advertising at all. And do you ever do any uh, any advertising to try to get people back to the beginning of the series, or is or do you just sort of depend upon those few people who are new who going back and getting to the old stuff? Oh yeah, all, all my AMS ads, well, most of them point to the the first book in the series. And when I when I do a launch, uh, I try to up the the sales of the first book. It looks good to have a you know a book in the top 100 on Amazon, but if it's the 14th book in the series and people want to look at the first book in the series and they go there and they see that, Oh, well, this one's his 14th one's ranked, you know, number 100, but this first one, it's ranked number 25,000. So you got to get those sales up on that first book before the launch and get that rank up higher. So it doesn't look so dis, you know, disproportionate. All right. Have you considered starting another series? And if so, are there any genres you're eager to try? I would love to write science fiction because I, I get nitpicked over on, you know, technical stuff, you know. Uh, Sci-fi writers get it too. <laughs> well, the muzzle velocity on an AK-47. Okay, I might have that off by 10, 10 feet per second. Well, you don't have that problem with a railgun. You just shoot that thing as fast and as often as you want. 
So you and can, you make, you can stuff make, up. make stuff up. It, it, it would be so freeing to be able to just write what you want to write. And if it doesn't work, make something up that makes it work. Yeah, you could do a sea adventures, but in space. I believe the original uh, Star Trek was inspired by like the Horatio Hornblower books. So why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did want to ask, uh, you mentioned with your launches, you could get into the top 100 on Amazon, which is super impressive. Is that, uh, do you have a super big newsletter at this point or how are people knowing to rush out and buy your book all that first week? Uh, my newsletters, uh, I've got about 6,000 subscribers and I interact with them twice a month. Usually, uh, usually I just write you know, a short email saying, you know, where I'm at in this next book, uh, what's coming up in the future, uh, how things are going around the, you know, the home fire. Uh, I, I asked, I asked my readers to help name characters and, uh, equipment. My, my readers named, uh, my main character's airplane and just, just interact with them just like they were your friends and on a regular basis so that when you do have a release and you send out that email, Hey, I got a new book. Here it is. And they look at you and say, well, who are you? I don't remember you. Why are you sending me this email? I didn't, I didn't subscribe to this and they've forgotten all about you in just a couple of months. So you have to maintain that, that, uh, that relationship on a regular basis. And that, you know, that takes a little bit of work, but, I mean, you do the same thing on Facebook with your friends. So just compile a couple of posts from Facebook and put it in the newsletter and off it goes. And, uh, I get, you know, on a, on a release, I have about 75% open rate and 45% click rate. For some reason, people still, even though I put the link right there in the email, they look at it and say, okay, close, close the email, open Amazon search. Just click the link. <laughs> but uh, most of them, most of them just do the search. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing a good job with the the newsletter. I think that especially when you are not releasing every month, like most people are not releasing something every month. You're you're right. It's it's really important to sort of stay in their heads and remind them who you are and, and why they enjoy you. I imagine if you're telling little snippets of your life and and that kind of thing that kind of since you're such, such a sea guy <laughs> that it kind of relate relays i don't know that's not the right word but ties into your your work and I, i'm sure they enjoy it too well like i said my office is right here on the icw i'm on in the third floor above a marina my boat is right down in the slip just below my deck outside and when people come by they you know in my books it says i, I live in beaufort south carolina and a lot of people, my, my books are available for sale. The paperbacks are available for sale in the marina store downstairs. And people are coming in there all the time and buying my books and my T-shirts. And they're just, you know, people cruising. They're cruising up the ICW, doing the, the Great Loop, or, you know, heading, heading south for the winter or whatever. And if they, if they happen to stop in and I'm, I'm down at, at the boat or in the store and I get to meet them face to face and uh, check out their boat. And that's always fun. And uh, it's, it's just a great way to build, build an audience uh, centered around your lifestyle. That sounds great. Do you uh, give any bonuses or anything to entice uh, readers to sign up to your newsletter initially? No, absolutely not. In fact, I make it hard. Uh, in my books, you won't find any links to uh, sign up. You'll find an invitation and to go to waynestennett.com, but even waynestennett.com is not a link. You have to put your Kindle down, turn on your laptop or your cell phone, type in www.waynestennett.com and go there, click on the uh, subs subscription page, and then it's a double opt-in from there. So you, you're actually gotta, you get, it's a four-fold process. Because I don't want anybody who wants to get something for free because I'm not giving away free stuff. I'm selling books. And nobody, when they sign up, they don't know that the, fir the first two days of a new release, the book's going to be discounted. They find that out when, when I make the announcement. But otherwise, they, they're assuming that the next book's going to be $6.99 just like the last one they bought. 
and uh, they don't get anything for free. They don't get any discount other than that first 48 hours. And uh, that's just a, a thank you to my core readers and they, they seem to really appreciate it. So I have to ask you because, uh, because of my poor website design that's 10 years old, uh, my email newsletters aren't the easiest to find, even though I do put a link in the back of the books. So I get a lot of people asking to be manually signed up. I'm now envisioning that you also get a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> like, can you add me to your newsletter? Does it does it work like that? I, I don't get a whole lot uh, because everywhere that there's a, uh, a call to action to subscribe to my newsletter, it tells you to go to my my website. And right there at the very top of the website, it's the very first thing you see, subscribe to my newsletter. So uh, I get, you know, once or twice a month, somebody will email me and ask me to add them to their, to my newsletter. And I reply and thank them for writing and I give them a link to my website. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put anybody's name or email address in, in my uh, subscription. You have to do that yourself. All right, well, it sounds like you've got your website designed so that it's easy for them to do that. That's good. Um, we wanted to go ahead and ask you a little bit about Novelist Inc. before uh, we let you go. Uh, since you are pretty involved with it, it sounds like now, can you let folks know what it is and why they might want to sign up? Novelist Incorporated, uh, NINC, is uh, a worldwide uh, organization of multi-published professional authors. Uh, you have to have a, you have to, you have to be vetted to join. Um, you're, if you're an indie author, you have to have two books that have sold $5,000 each in royalties in one year, each. Uh, if, you're in, if you're traditionally published, that drops to 2000 and uh, so it's, it's not the type of conference where you're going to have any, you know, uh, creative writing 101 classes, marketing 101 classes. Everybody that attends a NINC conference, these are, these are professionals that are already on their A game. They want new, fresh stuff. And that's what NINC provides. Yeah, I've heard from a lot of folks that they really, that it is a higher level conference and they've gotten a lot out of it. And even uh, not just from the panels, but from chatting with other authors that are also, you know, probably if you're there, you're probably a six figure or full time at least. And, you know, you're maybe a step above and have some advice and some really great ideas that you can share. Yeah, a, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the best part, of, uh, I agree, the best part about the Nate conference I mean, the information that you gather during the sessions, and we, uh, we run, this year we're going to have 72 hours of uh, material. And you get so much out of that. You need to schedule a week off after it to just consume and digest all that information. But the best part of it is after the sessions close, after hours, after dinner, everybody hangs out. Uh, there's the resort we have it at is uh, Trade Winds Resort in St. Pete Beach. Uh, beautiful white sand beach, uh, three pools, uh, several restaurants, five bars. Uh, the Tiki Bar is my favorite, it's right out on the beach. And that's where everybody gets together and you get to talk more in depth with, you know, the, the industry professionals. So you get to talk to people from BookBub, you get to talk to people from Amazon, from KDP from uh, D to D, uh, Readsy, all, all, all these big names in publishing, indie publishing, they all attend and uh, they, they do presentations. But the biggest draw is after hours when you get to sit down one on one and have a beer with somebody and talk about what they're doing and how you can fit into it or what you're doing and how they can fit into it. Now, uh, it seems like it's an extremely useful tool, even if you're only in it for the networking. But uh, like you say, you know, you have to be vetted. There's certain qualifications you have to make. Is this the sort of thing where you would suggest as soon as you qualify, you jump on it? Or, or do you feel like it's still, it's higher level for authors? Like, do you, do you still feel like there are, there's a certain level of authorly understanding you should be at before you join Nink or stuff is going to be still going over your head? No, as, as soon as you're eligible, if you, if, if you have the, if you can show the, uh, the proof that you've earned, you know, X number of dollars per book for a year, go ahead and, and uh, become a member because there's the, we, we have the NINC newsletter. It's 
N-I-N-K instead of N-I-N-C. Uh, that goes out once a month. We have uh, uh, email group and a lot of information is going back and forth daily on emails. And there's just so much going on and so much information that you can learn from people who have already done it. People who have already beat the beast down and conquered it. And these, for, for somebody just starting out and, you know, just now for the first time in their life, they're, they're thinking, wow, I can have a job that doesn't involve going to somebody else's office and making somebody else rich. And you get to learn from all these great, intelligent people. And there's no, there's no reason to delay learning. Uh, some things may be over your head. That's, no, that's okay. You just raise your hand and say, hey, wait a minute. I don't understand what you said. Could you repeat that? Give me more details. And the people with Nink are some of the greatest people I've ever met. And we just love sharing information. And uh, like Lindsay said, the introverts, it is so cool to see when all these, you get a whole group of 400, 300, 500 introverts all in one room. And then afterwards, you're all sitting down to dinner together and then drinking tequila together. And then one thing leads to, and I call it, I call it our tribe. Uh, we have, I mean, once you're with your tribe, you can be who you are. You can be the nerd. You can be the, 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 the anything you want. But you're with other people who are exactly like you. And that's, that's the coolest thing. All right. I have a question. My last question for you is how often should an author consider attending like some of these conferences or workshops? Are there any that you favor? I would definitely, if you're, if you're eligible to be a member of NINC and, and uh, become a member, you don't want to miss a single NINC conference. There's so much that happens from year to year that if you miss a year, by the time you come back, everything you're doing is ancient history. Um, I like to go to the Key West Mystery Fest just because it's in Key West and I can write off a week's vacation in Key West. And, uh, but those are really the only two conferences that I attend. And I know there's a lot of other great ones, but uh, I just don't have the time. It's, it's, there's, so, there's so much involved in producing good material these days that you just have to, do, you have to spend all your time, basically. I work probably 60 hours a week right here in this office. And uh, I work weekends sometimes. I don't write on the weekends, but I do come into the office and answer emails. I leave my computer at the office when I go home. It's made my home life a whole lot better. I'm completely unplugged. I don't do emails when I'm at home. I, I, you know, I, I check my, my personal Facebook page, but other than that, I'm completely unplugged. And me and my wife and our daughter, we, we do things together. We, we go swimming in the pool. We go for walks. We go for bike rides. Uh, we just hang out on the couch and watch TV and turn in vegetables. But it's made my home life a whole lot better, leaving work at work and leaving home at home. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then why it might not be a bad idea to have a separate office uh, for some people, even if you just have to have it in your own home, it can be a, a place that you shut the door and don't go back to to the next morning. But um, that is about all we've got for you for questions. Do you want to maybe plug your new release coming up and uh, remind us where we can find you online? Uh, my new release is uh, Rising Charity. It's the 14th book in the Jesse McDermott series. Uh, not to be confused with the Charity Style series. Charity's a character in several, quite a few of the Jesse novels, and Jesse's a character in quite a few of the Charity novels. So, but uh, also Pirate Radio. I got to give Pirate Radio a plug. It's p y r o a t e radio dot com. And uh, if you like trap rock music, or if you like country music, or blues, or bluegrass, or jazz, or hip hop, or whatever. Uh, we play it all. It's just a big, big wide spectrum of music, but it's all got a, got a kind of a tropical feel to it, I guess. All right. Sounds very fun. And I will get the link from you for the, the pirate radio and I'll, your website, of course, and for Nink. So anybody that uh, missed those can come on by marketing SFF.com. This is episode 218 and uh, you can get the links and hop over and check out Wayne's stuff. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this week, Wayne. Well, thanks for having me, y'all. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for hanging out with us, Williams. Nice to meet you. 
Nice to meet y'all. Bye-bye.